Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. And today we have the secret master of fandom, that would be me, giving a review of Superman and Lois Season 1, Episode 4, named Haywire. Now, just as an introduction, and unlike a lot of reviewers, I don't just sit down and rehash the plot, pausing to say what I liked or didn't like. Ordinarily, you'll find a lot more depth in terms of what goes into making a TV show or movie. But in this case, I have something that I did a little bit of math on and something I did a little bit of research on and was very pleasantly surprised. But we'll get into that. And that's all I'm really going to talk about. But we'll just take it as read that if you've come to this review looking for a review, you've either watched Superman and Lois Season 1, Episode 4, or you don't care if it's spoiled for you. But nevertheless, for safety's sake, we should probably issue a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a secret master of fandom, and that means that the fandom is strong with me. Now, this is neither a boast nor a brag. This is just where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction. But the problem with secret masters of fandom is that we are cursed. We just can't see all the new stuff without seeing the entire century that came before. We discover that there's very little that's actually original, and sometimes it interferes with our ability to enjoy things. Now, one thing I don't do is outrage reviews. There are a lot of reviewers who are just simply actors portraying outrage because outrage sells. They hate everything as a knee-jerk reflex because their viewers want to see them hate things. But this causes a weird feedback loop between fans and popular reviewers. And ultimately, nobody likes anything. Now, I don't do that. If I like something, I'll say why, usually in excruciating detail. If I dislike something, I'll say why, typically in excruciating detail. But I don't do outrage. Unlike other reviewers, I am the adult in this particular room. So, I always like to call out great moments, and there were some that really, really surprised me. Now, I'm from Lincoln, Nebraska, a city of about 324,000, I think it is right now. And Nebraska borders Kansas on the south. And I was generally, with this show, prepared to say that as far as I knew, there had been no coal mining in Kansas ever. But I was wrong. And not only that, but in this case, the writers actually did a lot of homework on this. I was really surprised. You see, until 1997, there was coal mining in the extreme southeastern Kansas along the Kansas-Missouri border. That was largely centered uh, in the town of Pittsburgh, Kansas, about 123 miles south of Kansas City. Now, Pittsburgh is far too large to be a stand-in for Smallville. However, there is a location at the intersection of U.S. Highway 400 and Kansas Highway 103 that currently has very little there but could sport a town in an alternate universe. So for those who are anal retentive, what I have chosen as the probable site of Smallville, Kansas, would have it at the coordinates 37.309733 by negative 94.705363. <laughs> the really interesting thing about this is that Lois has repeatedly mentioned um, visiting a Carthage, didn't specify where, uh, regarding Morgan Edge's mining in this town. Well, it turns out that Carthage, Missouri, is only about 30 miles from the location that I have posted for Kansas, right along the Kansas-Missouri border. So, <laughs> more than that, the reopening of a small mill mine makes perfect sense. There was mining in that area until 1997, much to my surprise. <laughs> and the loss of this would have been a major economic blow to the area and probably caused the town to start dying like we see. So, <laughs> wow. Good on the Superman and Lois writers. They correctly located Smallville in one of the few areas that ever had coal mining in Kansas and referenced a larger city, coal mining city, and correctly knew it. They actually knew something that I didn't know about the area. I didn't think that could happen with Hollywood writers. 
Now, I was also prepared to criticize the prevalence of trees in that particular area because most of Kansas is pretty flat with a lot of grain growing and stuff like that. But then I got into Google Maps, went to uh, the satellite view, and went into street view, and lo and behold, the town of the location where I've got Smallville is you know, far enough south in Kansas that there actually is some trees and foliage that you really don't see in northern Kansas. But there's also a lot of wide open spaces like we see on the Kent farm. So, wow, you know, they, they're getting this stuff right, much to my shock and surprise. But having more or less pinpointed the location of Smallville, I'm going to get really anal retentive about travel from Smallville to Metropolis. But you see, I have done the math so that you don't have to. And what other reviewer is going to say that? So, the location of Metropolis is important. In uh, Doomsday Clock number 7, published only three years ago on September 26, 2018, the address of the Daily Planet was specifically given as 2525 Broadway, Metropolis, New York, 10025. Well, this zip code actually places it in New York City in our universe. And what's actually there, if you look as it scrolls past, you can see I've got the location in Manhattan where that would be located. There's actually a fitness sports center there. <laughs> However, due to the fact that General La Sam Lane, which is Lois' father, is frequently traveling from Smallville to Metropolis, we have to assume that there is a municipal airport at Smallville. Now, that makes sense. I've been in a lot of small towns, much like the one you see behind me, uh, which, by the way, is the birthplace of John Wayne, Winterset, Iowa, where I lived for a while, that do have municipal airports, small ones. So... This might give General Lane immediate access to a small U.S. Army owned and maintained jet aircraft that he would use for his own personal use. Now, the distance from Smallville to Metropolis would be about 1,100 miles. Now, if the Army had a, say, Bombardier Challenger 650, which clocks out at about 554 miles per hour, General Lane's travel time from Smallville to Metropolis would be about two hours. And this is fairly reasonable given what we've seen. Lois, on the other hand, is a whole other problem. She probably doesn't have her own jet, <laughs> and uh, she wouldn't have access to one. Um, and really, most of the time, a jet won't fly out of the small-town municipal airport. I don't even know if it would be rated for jets. Uh, we'll just assume that it is. But she would instead have to either make the 2-hour and 21-minute drive to Kansas City International Airport, as shown here, or probably, more likely, charter a probably small um, prop aircraft from Smallville to Kansas City. Now, it's reasonable that there is a pilot in Smallville that might have a small aircraft like a Cessna 152, and that aircraft clocks out at about 123 miles an hour, making the flight from Smallville to Kansas City International about 1 hour 12 minutes. Now, in the real world, there are two nonstop flights out of Kansas City to New York City, which is Metropolis in this case, which in the real world, each of which runs about two hours, 40 minutes. Now, she gets in and out really fast with really, really expedited airport security, which might be possible as the daughter of a general. This would make the trip at least three hours, 55 minutes. Now, with real-world security, it's probably longer. But 3 hours and 55 is the absolute minimum. But you have to also add to this the time to get from Metropolis Airport to the Daily Planet, probably by taxi cab or by Uber. But Lois going back and forth from Smallville to Metropolis, as we've seen, really isn't something that should happen very lightly, nor very, should it happen very much because of the time involved. Could she do a round trip in one day? Yes, if she didn't do too much while she was there in Metropolis. Now, Superman is a whole other issue. <laughs> we generally give Superman a very serious pass because we don't really know what the top speed at which he can fly. However, I'm the curious type, so I did the math so that you don't have to. Now, I take my cues from a Dr. James Kakakalios, who suggested that with superheroes, you have to give them a one-time miracle exemption from the laws of nature that explains away their powers. 
But Superman has a lot of powers. And actually, I met Dr. Kakaklios at a convention a few years ago. I asked him about this, and he told me that some of his uh, physicist friends, Dr. Kakaklios is a physicist, had suggested that Superman actually only has one superpower. And that superpower is that he can control inertia. And that, in fact, explains all of his powers. Flying easy, picking up anything from any location, any part of it, picking up a boat from the front, which would ordinarily tear it loose. If you can control the inertia of the boat, that isn't going to happen. It's, it explains all of his powers, his vision, his flight, everything. So Superman can control the inertia of both himself and anything that he touches. And this means that when you're dealing with his top speed, all bets are off. Even gravity, if you can control inertia, is going to operate in his favor rather than against it. Now, we've seen Superman fly from Metropolis uh, to the Kent Farm in less time than it takes to say only a few words. So let's say that that's about five seconds. That would make his speed at about 792,000 miles per second. The speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. And that means that Superman can fly at least 4.26 times the speed of light. Now, this sort of wreaks a lot of havoc with Einstein's theories of relativity. But again, given that can, Superman can control inertia, well, pretty much all bets are off. But in any case, this is also consistent with his flying from, you know, Smallville to China in time to stop a bridge from collapsing like we saw last week. Superman is just plain fast. We don't even know if 4.26 times the speed of light is even his top speed. However, at that speed, he could reach Alpha Centauri, which is our nearest neighbor, uh, neighbor star, in really only one year and three months. Now, that may seem like a long time, but consider with our present technology, the trip one way he would take over 16,000 years. Superman is just plain fast. In terms of some of the criticism and review of the rest of the episode, uh, one thing you have to mention here is that when you're doing a superhero show, there has to be a very delicate balance between action and other drama without the character development becoming a victim of what I call the charmed syndrome. Uh, I call it that because I first noticed it in the early, late 1990s, early 2000s TV series Charmed, the original one. It's being remade badly now. Um, by the way, the only reason I watched that show was for the three hot chicks. Um, but I noticed it first there, and that would be where they'd be going on with some great action, and then all of a sudden they'd pull the brakes, stop the train to do character development, and they'd talk and they'd talk and they'd talk. We see a ton of this in all of the CW um, products, IPs. They just, they're doing some great cool stuff. Flash will be doing some cool stuff, and then... Let's stop and talk about our feelings for 10 minutes. It's just awful. Last week was, um, you know, probably a little too little action. But this week, it was a very good mix. Um, it was a really good mix between, you know, basically two different things happening at the same time. How Clark's dealing with that, you know, and, and you know, dealing with his family and dealing with, you know, threats from, you know, supervillains, although admittedly this wasn't much of a challenge for him, really. Um, but still, it was a good balance between the action and it shows, you know, the character development that you need. You're not talking about your feelings. You're showing the fact that Clark is now having to jostle these two things. So, Great. I also continue to enjoy the relationship between Jonathan and Jordan. I really like that we continue to see a family that can work out their problems and isn't dysfunctional like about 99% of the other families currently on TV. Please, writers, please continue to do this. Now, there were some things that I might call cringe moments. We are now seeing underage drinking and hearing about illicit drug use. Now, this is probably realistic even for a small town, but it's a small town where everybody knows everybody, and somebody's going to catch on probably sooner rather than later. And then a whole bunch of somebodies, the teenagers who are doing the underage drinking, are going to be in trouble, particularly with Jonathan and Jordan, because Clark is going to find out, because he's Superman. 
Um, one of the other things that bothered me was Superman taking that uh, super speeded up kid, and I, I forgive me for not remembering his name, and I didn't look it up in the credits before I started this, in so high an altitude that the kid passes out. Now, Superman says that the air is thinner up there will help calm him down. But as you can see from the rest of this review, I am be, can be a very serious stickler for scientific details. Taking a kid up so high that he passes out hints at oxygen deprivation and the potential brain damage. Now, you guys have done an extraordinary job of being kind to those of us in this part of the country and figuring out Smallville and Kansas and where it's located and how the coal mining works there. That's great. Please don't do anything dumb like taking a kid up so high that he could pass out from oxygen deprivation. Makeup, please take away, I've said this all three or four weeks now, please take away that stupid stubble that Clark is sporting. Superman shaves. Period. End of story. Costumers, I keep saying it over and over, change the costume to spandex. Tyler Hecklin is a pretty buff dude. He does not need a modified muscle suit. So at the end of any episode, you know, we might ask ourselves, is it any good? Well, my scale on this is one is passable and five is Hugo, or the Hugo Award. Because frack the Emmys, they don't matter. What really matters is the Hugo Award. Well, I'm giving this one about a 4.5. It is not going to win a Hugo Award. But I am amazed both at how kind the writers have been to people in my part of the country because believe me I see it all the time where we are stereotyped have southern dialects and stupid crap like that and and are just hayseeds and hicks who don't know anything no we're not doing that thank you thank you thank you so much it is such a welcome change thank you um, I'm also again I was really really impressed about your research into coal mining in Kansas and where that ultimately places Smallville logically so, you get a 4.5 because you actually surprised a secret master of fandom. You really surprised the hell out of me, and trust me, that rarely happens. So my advice, watch this show. It continues, in my opinion, to be the best live-action Superman since Richard Donner's 1978 film, and the best TV Superman since the DC Animated Universe in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And that's all I have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks. I'll do my best to respond to you. And of course, please like, sub, and hit the notification bell and share me on social media. So thanks for watching. That's all the time that we have today for this episode of Tales from SYO Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.